Let's talk neoliberalism and the class divide. The COVID-19 outbreak has caused an unprecedented rupture in the world's capitalist economies, with huge numbers of workers being laid off, furloughed, or generally left unemployed. In Australia, the amount of people over the age of 15 out of work dropped from 62.5% to 58.7% of the population, with youth unemployment especially, 16.1% nationally. In the United States, the unemployment rate rose to 13.3%, in France, it's 8.1, and in Brazil, 12.6. Now, those numbers certainly seem maybe reassuring. <laughs> it could be a whole lot worse. <laughs> I'm obviously being facetious. It is much worse because governments calculate these figures by leaving out intentionally major subsets of the population. The official Australian unemployment rate sits at 7.1%, but this doesn't take into account 3.1 million people accepting the JobKeeper subsidy, a wage subsidy designed to provide job security and at least some money whilst jobs just weren't there. It also doesn't include those no longer looking for work, say if you're caring for someone who's sick, or if you work a single hour a week in a casual job, you're considered unemployed, even if you're drastically underemployed. The numbers are similar in the UK and the statistics are manipulated accordingly. Wage subsidies cover 9.1 million jobs in the UK and those people are kept off unemployment statistics even A, if they aren't working and B, are now receiving a lower wage than they received previously. Long story short, we're in a crisis. You may or may not have noticed. Some governments have reacted uh, poorly. Some have reacted in such a way that they are now being lionized by the majority of the center-left leaning world. In Australia, where I live, our Prime Minister Scott Morrison has been fine. I wasn't expecting much, but it seems like he's done the bare minimum and everybody loves it. He doubled the unemployment benefit and introduced a $1,500 per fortnight wage subsidy, the aforementioned JobKeeper. Both perfectly good decisions, but he also set an arbitrary September deadline for these to completely disappear with the purpose of uh, getting people back to work, you know? We can't keep people on these subsidies for too long or they'll start living off them. On top of this, Scotty has not allowed universities access to wage subsidies, decimated the arts industry through neglect. Yes, I'm including the $250 million of loans, which isn't money given to us, it's money given to banks to claw back from us, and demonize the Black Lives Matter protesters as disease carriers, even though in the first weeks of said virus, he let a huge Hillsong conference go ahead, which directly affected the communities that those people went back into. But whatever you think about ScoMo's response, today we're gonna to talk about how and why he and his media buddies push an offensive line about the unemployed and needlessly hurt Australians. Please don't turn away. This is a global issue. Every government does this. I can guarantee you. On June 29th, Scott Morrison, Australian Prime Minister, told 2GB Talkback Radio that the government had heard anecdotal evidence from businesses that some of them were finding it hard to get people to take the shifts because they were on these higher levels of payment. On the face of it, if you've never met a poor person, that sounds plausible. Why would you work when you're receiving all this cash for free? Not only does that line of thinking display an absolutely monstrous level of privilege, it's also completely incorrect. First, anecdotal evidence is by definition not necessarily true or reliable because it relies on personal accounts and not facts and data. Secondly, the data, which Scotty has most definitely seen because he's the Prime Minister, shows the exact opposite. According to the Australian Unemployed Workers Union, there are over 1,600,000 unemployed job seekers in this country and there are just over 90,000 jobs listed on the listing website Seek. That is 18 job seekers for every job. The Guardian received data from Seek itself, showing that there was a 16% increase in responses received by employers at the end of June, in comparison to pre-COVID. Directly contradicting the PM. And finally, the survey News Corps, run by the Murdoch Press, is pushing from the National Skills Commission, says 27% of employers were having difficulty finding workers, and more than 50% of those employers blamed this on the lack of applicants. <laughs> Wait, no, just needed to read a little bit further. Out of the 2,324 businesses surveyed, only 72 were struggling, because only a quarter of the businesses were actively recruiting. Within that group, the top industry struggling for workers was childcare, a sector that was struggling to recruit workers before the pandemic. So it seems like the government was entirely wrong, and so why would they lie? Why would they push this 
harmful rhetoric? The answer, of course, is capitalism. I'm joking, kinda. The reason for this rhetoric is simple and complex, as all good economic issues are. The simple answer is that demonising the working underclass has been a thing for decades. And this most recent outbreak is just an example of the endemic discrimination that occurs in capitalist societies against those on the basis of class. The more complex answer involves the roots of neoliberalism and so-called fiscal prudence. So, what is neoliberalism? As described by one of the fathers of neoliberal economics and evil gnome, Milton Friedman, Neoliberalism would accept the 19th century liberal emphasis on the fundamental importance of the individual, but it would substitute for the 19th century goal of laissez-faire as a means to an end, the goal of the competitive order. It would seek to use competition amongst producers to protect consumers from exploitation, competition among employers to protect workers and owners of property, and competition among consumers to protect the enterprises themselves. The state would police the system, establish conditions favourable to competition and prevent monopoly, provide a stable monetary framework, and relieve acute misery and distress. The citizens would be protected against the state by the existence of a free private market, and against one another by the preservation of competition. In short, the freer the markets, the freer the people. The state's role is minimal, only protecting the right to competition, and providing the stable currency with which to trade with. Friedman explicitly mentions preventing monopoly, but, you know, most neoliberal governments can err on the side of caution when applying their antitrust legislation. Neoliberalism got its first real-world test under the Chilean military dictatorship under Augusto Pinochet, a man who overthrew a democratically elected government with the backing of the United States, murdered thousands of people, and tortured or interred hundreds of thousands more. The Chicago Boys, a group of Friedman-trained economists instituted a wide range of economic reform, including mass deregulation, privatisation, including that of social security and water, and the banning of trade unions. These policies transformed Chile into South America's best performing economy throughout the 90s. But by the end of Pinochet's reign, 44% of Chilean people lived in poverty, and the wealthiest 10% had seen their wealth rise by 83%. In 2019, protests broke out in Chile against continuing neoliberal economic policies that can be traced directly back to the Pinochet regime. Pinochet himself was arrested in 1998 for human rights violations and was released because of ill health and allowed to return to Chile, where he died with 300 charges still pending against him. But neoliberalism lives on. According to an article entitled Neoliberalism, Inequality and Politics, The Changing Face of Australia, Australia, neoliberal economies such as that of Australia and the United States have an overarching national drive to increase economic gains, decrease public expenditure, and decrease the individual reliance on state-provided social welfare. Reagan, Thatcher, Hawke, Keating, Lang, Mubarak, Rafael Videla all pioneered economic reform centred around deregulation, income and corporate tax cuts, and deep cuts to government spending. In Australia, neoliberalism was labelled economic rationalism and was championed by the Labour Party, then continued under the Prime Ministership of John Howard, where we reach our phase of Fiscal prudence, a concept whereby governments prioritise balancing the budget over increasing spending on necessary services. You've heard the phrases before, we have to live within our means, run the government like a personal budget. We can't spend money we don't have, there's no big money tree. Leaving aside the fact that spending money that you don't have is what governments do, and do all the time, you have to ask yourself, what is the purpose of surplus? Why have money sitting unused when there are people sleeping rough? <laughs> When you're sitting on unspent money, why are there people going untreated in your medical system? It's because a majority of citizens don't know how economies work. The masses love short, snappy phrases that stick in their heads, and it's why you hear the same cliches over and over and over again from politician from politician, because they work. Which brings us to politicians, their chosen media, and how they discuss the poor. Neoliberalism is a right-wing ideology, no matter the party putting it forward. Sorry, Keating, Obama, European Union stands. Your fave is problematic. And at its core, it is an ideology designed to cut spending and prioritise market solutions. Namely, a free market. This involves dismantling social security and socialised medicine, the removal of subsidies for unproductive industry, and the privatisation of utilities, just as we saw in Chile. 
But the programs neoliberalism wants to dismantle are broadly very popular. The Morgan poll shows that since the 90s, Australians rate Medicare, the socialised medical program that covers every Australian, as the highest priority policy that government should focus on. With an AC Nielsen poll finding that 72% of Australians would forego a tax cut if the money was spent on social services. Pew Research showed that in 2019, 74% of Americans do not want social security benefits reduced in any way, and that 6 out of 10 Americans would revert the 2017 tax cut legislation that cut entitlement programs. In the UK, 92% of people say that the NHS has a funding problem, although they are split on how to increase said funding. If properly funding these programs is so popular, then how do neoliberal governments go about cutting them? Simple. By demonising the recipients and turning the population against services and their users. Reagan pioneered the simultaneous classist, sexist and racist welfare queen stereotype, the lazy and underclass woman abusing the taxpayer by taking them for a ride and never giving back. Consecutive Liberal governments in Australia have attempted to place burden after burden on welfare recipients, from drug testing before they get paid, to the onerous cashless welfare card that prevents you from spending your money anywhere other than where they say you should. Reality TV across the globe expressly demonises the poor and working class because it sells. Benefit Street, the great big benefits wedding in the UK. Cops and RBT in Australia almost exclusively follow police belittling and harassing working class neighbourhoods. Right wing owned media and news follow suit. Poor families in the United States are not what they used to be. When you look at the actual living conditions of the 43 million people that the census says are poor, you see that in fact they have all these modern conveniences. 99% of them have a refrigerator. <laughs> 99% have refrigerators. <laughs> you food chilling mother. We've now addicted an awful lot of people onto welfare, and that always ends up. All the models from the Grattan Institute and all that are irrelevant. People get addicted to free money, and you can't get them off it. We're all up for the safety net, but we don't want a hammock. Now, Give us, give us, please, let me have it, let me stay on the tits. I mean, it's just <laughs> a joke. The working class, a group that is increasingly made up of people of colour, is demonised by government so that the average viewer at home turns against recipients of government welfare. They can't fulfil the neoliberal agenda of privatisation, small government and deregulation unless those polling numbers drop. And they don't drop. The only way the public gets on board with cuts is if they don't think the recipients need the help. And that's where we are today. Morrison wants the benefits to drop in September with no pushback, even if you could get four years of JobKeeper out of the 270 billion he's paying the United States for missiles. When you're burning through cash at a rate of almost 11 billion dollars a month on JobKeeper, then obviously that's not something you can uh, continue in that form forever. Trump's major COVID response was a single payment that many people still haven't received. In the UK, US, Australia and many others, right-wing governments have been pushing to prematurely open the economy so more people can go to work and less have to rely on the benefit. It's the power of rhetoric and it needles into your brain and makes you believe things that are just plain untrue. So next time you see a politician complaining that people are rotting the welfare system, you'll know it's untrue. Next time you read an article complaining that immigrants are taking the jobs of working class people, you'll know that it's just demonising working class immigrants trying to make a living. The next time you're forced to listen to someone use the word doll bludger, welfare queen, or criminal thug, or various other dog whistles to describe people who just can't catch a break, push back. You know the facts. Show them the truth. Remember, the only way that they can cut these services that people rely on, that you one day might have to rely on, is if you and everyone in your community thinks that people don't deserve them and everyone deserves a happy, dignified, and safe life. 81% have a microwave. 78% have air conditioning. 63% have cable TV. 54% have cell phones. 48% have a coffee maker. 25% have a dishwasher. 25% of a dishwasher? <laughs> Although to be fair, after a 12-hour shift of washing dishes, the last thing you want is to bring your work home with you.